Praise the Lord. We do honor you this morning, Lord Jesus. Every word, every adjective they used is true. You are holy and righteous. Oh, how powerful and mighty, yet humble you are. Jesus, we bless you today. Father God, I thank you that you have anointed these musicians and singers in such a way as to prepare our heart. My heart is stirred today. I love you, Jesus. And I can only love you because you first loved me. We lift our hands, Lord, and our hearts, and we thank you for your unfailing love to us. Not one time have you ever failed us. Not once have you ever been late. Never have you forgotten your promises to us. I praise you this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, we come to the Father and we thank Thank you, Holy Heavenly Father, Abba Father, our Father, for sending your Son to save us from our sins. And we thank you, Jesus, for sending the Holy Spirit to open our understanding that we might know you. Thank you for it all, God. May you be praised praised and pleased throughout this service. And everybody said amen. amen. If you don't mind, just, just remain standing for a moment. I want to read a portion of Scripture to you. This is from Romans chapter 3. What then, uh, are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin, as it is written. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now, the righteousness of God apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. The word of the Lord. Thank you for being seated. For all have sinned and come short of the glory 
of God. All have sinned. But what is sin? For far too long the church has picked out certain vices, uh, habits that they determine to be sin, but in the purely biblical sense, sin is transgression. It's overstepping the boundary. It's going into evil. Sin is iniquity. It's what we do. You've, you've heard me say it many times. We do what we do because we are who we are. Sin is not what you do. It's who you are. And you can stop doing things that look sinful, but you cannot change who you are without supernatural help. Sin is error. It's a departure from the right way. Sin is missing the mark. It's going where God never intended for one to go. Sin is a trespass. You've intruded in with your self-will into the holiness of God. Sin is lawlessness, spiritual anarchy. You live your own life the way you want to live it. Sin is unbelief. Just not believing there is a God, or if there is a God, he has no control or right over you. Those are the biblically technical terms of sin. Sin started with Satan. Came into the world through Adam. Sin brings all the penalties of death. You die spiritually, you die physically. The curse of sickness and disease is in the human race because of Adam. There is no remedy for sin except the blood of Jesus Christ. And there is no way to have your sins forgiven except by exercising faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. It's not faith in your ability to break a habit. It's not having faith in your strength to change your life and discontinue certain things. No, the faith has to be in what Jesus did on the cross. The cross, the old rugged cross. So sin is an act. Look at the world, that's sin. Everything they're doing is sin. Even their righteous deeds are sinful deeds. We are living in a world controlled by sinners. But they are not in charge. I just want to say that. We are living in a dying, fallen, cursed world. All we can do is live by faith and trust in the Lord. But God is ultimately going to have the last word and clean this thing up. All the actions that you are watching the world perform are sinful actions. It's a state. It's where you are. You can't get out. Sin blocks you, jails you in. Sin is a nature inside of you, and we all know that nature. Even as a saved child of God right now, I recognize that nature that I was born with. It is obstinate, <coughs> rebellious, and every time I want to do right, it fights me. The flesh fights against the spirit, and the spirit fights against the flesh, 
and it never stops. There is no rest. There is no reprieve. So that you cannot do all the good you want to do because of the evil that resides in every one of us. Therefore, in order for someone to be saved, they must be redeemed. I think many, many times over the years, I have preached things that are especially uh, precious to me. They made an impact on me. And one of those things was this illustration that we have when Jesus was notified that Lazarus had died. Jesus was several days away, several days' journey. He did not hurry up to go back to heal him. He just let him die. And when he finally got back, they said, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus said, I've already told you. If you'll believe in me, I will show you the glory of God. I am the resurrection. I am the life. There is no death in me. No death comes out of me. I am life. I give life. Death never wins when I walk up. And so he said, where is he? And they said, Lord, he's in the tomb and he's been there four days. And by now, I'm sure the stench is unbearable. Jesus said, take me to him. Jesus came to the tomb, the stinking tomb. Surrounded by mourning, weeping, crying people. Look at the situation. Death, stench, misery, mourning. And Jesus walked up to the tomb and Jesus wept. Why did Jesus weep? Because from the beginning it was not supposed to be this way. But sin entered. And when sin entered, death entered too. But from the beginning, this was not what Jesus had envisioned. He never, never wanted people to mourn. There should never have been a death, a, a, a burial, a funeral. There should never be sadness and sorrow. But sin came into the world. And when Jesus Finished weeping, he said, roll the stone away. You know the rest of the story. They rolled it away, and the Bible says that Jesus cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And in just moments, that mummy began to worm his way out. I don't know how all that worked. I, I, I tried to imagine it. And even with my vivid imagination, I just don't know how that would have worked. All I know is a man wrapped up like a mummy who was dead came out of that grave. He was alive. And Jesus looked at the people around him and them and said, Loose him and let him go. Unwrap him. He can't unwrap himself. He couldn't raise himself. And he can't unwrap himself. He needs some help. I can do the raising, but you've got to do the unwrapping. Isn't that beautiful? He said, this is not just about what I'm able to do through supernatural power. This is what I'm calling you to do. Unwrap him. Loose him. Let him go. That is the most beautiful illustration. And oft times you've heard me use those Greek words that describe redemption. The first one is agorazo. Don't you love it when preachers use Greek? Agorazo. And it means to come into the marketplace. And the vision is of slaves on slave blocks chained and being sold and beaten and persecuted and misused because they are property only. And so the word to begin to describe redemption is that someone came into the marketplace, that someone was somewhere else, but that someone came into the marketplace. 
The next term is ex agorazo, which means to take out of the marketplace. The someone that invaded the marketplace paid a price for the slave and then unchained him and took him out of the marketplace. Hallelujah to God. The slave could not free himself from ownership or from chains, but the one who invaded the marketplace had the power to do both. Ex agarazzo, he paid the price, and then he took him out, and then he said, you're free, and you're free from now on. That's what redemption is. That's what salvation is all about. He left heaven. He put on a human body. He came down into the slave market called the world. He saw you and you and us bound by sin, slaves of darkness, unable to help ourselves. Our whole life was at the behest of the enemy. The devil controlled us. Our nature condemned us. But God, who is rich in mercy, God sent his only son into the world that whoever believes in him can leave the marketplace, can leave the statute of slavery. And Jesus did it with his own blood. He came, he took us out, and he loosed us. Every one of us, who knows Christ is loose, we're free. Now, I don't read anything there where Lazarus picked up his mummy clothes, his wrappings. Jesus didn't say, now clean up after yourself. And others didn't say, don't leave that here. We don't want to fool with that. You, you have to carry that around. I don't see where Lazarus said, you know, uh, that's who I was, and I don't ever forget where... I want to forget where I came from or who I was. I'll just take these with me. No, he left them there. And when you come, hallelujah, to the next chapter, after that raising of Lazarus from the dead, it goes like this. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. So I'm letting you know that's the same Lazarus. After he's raised from the dead, then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. They made him there a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. I'm not telling you anything new. I'm telling you something that excites me. The whole point of being saved, redeemed, forgiven from all of your transgressions. Listen, the whole point of him coming to get you and take you out is so that you can move from the tomb to the table. You don't stand around the tomb the rest of your life and talk about wounds and scars and bad upbringing and bad environment and talk about how you didn't have a chance in life. Nobody cared about you. Jesus cared about you. Jesus left there and came here. Jesus let them kill him. Jesus shed his blood so that when he unwraps you, when they let you go, you don't have to drag what you were around with you for the rest of your life. You're saved. You've been delivered. You're washed. God is for you. Doesn't matter who's against you. What a miracle this is, brothers and sisters, that he would come and find me, that he would lay his hand on me, that he would have such a plan for me. He didn't just come to save me. He came 
teach me how to feast with him at his table. He didn't raise Lazarus and then say, carry on, have a good day. He said, no, now that I've bought you, and now that you are mine and you are free, let's go eat. Let's enjoy fellowship. Folks, if you're not enjoying intimacy with Jesus, if you're not sitting at the table feasting with the Lord that saved you, I'm not sure you really understand what redemption is all about. Folks, this is the most wonderful story in the world. God wants fellowship with us. Jesus wants to eat with the redeemed. The Lord God Almighty craves, if I may use that term, for you and me to be in his presence. That's the whole point of him giving up everything. He laid down his royalty. He left glory. He got up off his throne. He was planted in the womb of a young woman that in all things he might be tempted like us and bear our burdens and understand our need. And he grew up and he walked in faithfulness and righteousness. There was no sin in him. There was no guile in him. And he lived his whole life in a world that did not want him. But God had a purpose and God has a plan. And I'm in it. And you're in it. And it wasn't just to show the universe that he could raise the dead or set the captive free. No, it was more than that. It was to show the universe, I have fellowship with the ones that I have redeemed by my blood. Fellowship, fellowship, fellowship. So when you hold that little cup of juice, and that little piece of bread. How many times have we done this? Hundreds. But to me, it's brand new every time. It reminds me, he did this for me. This is not a religious liturgical activity. This is my chance. This is our chance in this house of God today to enjoy a meal with him at the table. Jesus told his disciples on the night that he was betrayed, he said, you, you take this bread, you eat it, and we'll drink it together and enjoy it, but I'm not going to do this again until I do it with you in my Father's kingdom. So while the church has done this, while we have done it hundreds and hundreds of times, Jesus hasn't done it since. He tells us to do it, to remember him. Remember me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are proclaiming by this action, my death until I come back for you. So that's what we're doing right now. It's not just fellowship, but angels are bending over. They, they do it all the, all the time. They're bending over and saying, look, they're eating that bread again. Oh, I hear them screaming, the Lord's death was sufficient. Angels are watching us as we go through this. And when we take the juice and we drink it, angels are amazed. Heavenly beings stand at attention because by eating and drinking, we are proclaiming, screaming, yelling, Jesus is the Lamb of God. Jesus' blood was sufficient for my sins. Calvary was God's action. The tomb is empty. The church is full. And he's coming back to get his church any moment. Oh, it may be a little quieter in here today because we have the elements. But there's a drum roll in heaven. And as we look at those elements, angels begin to look at us with stark amazement. Then they look at the Father because they're always beholding his face, you know. And they have to be wondering, what is it about them that makes you want to give up your son to have them in your presence forever? Oh, Father, what is it about that group of rebels that you love so much that you would send your son down to die for them 
so that you could have fellowship with them. Oh, Father, we've been here with you from the beginning. We've served you in every way, but you've got your eye on them. What is it about them? I'll tell you what it is. We are his purchased redemption. We are his body. We are his bride. We are his beloved. And everything revolves around us. So this is the new covenant. Jesus simply said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Let me hold it there, Pastor. And just pray I don't spill it. This is the new covenant. New covenant. That's what Paul was saying in Romans chapter 3 there. It's not about the law. Nobody can keep it. The law only came to show us our sins. The law was given to show us that we can't do anything about our sins. Every time you read the law, you recognize you're a hopeless, helpless, doomed sinner. That's the old covenant. But the new covenant is redemption, not by law, but by blood. And may I just add this? It's mighty. The Bible says when God delivered Israel from Egypt, he did it with a mighty arm and a strong hand. He showed his full force to say, these are my people. May I add this? He did the same thing when he bought you and me, a strong arm and a mighty hand a bleeding side, perforated hands and feet, a crown on his head, mocking and jeering and hell thinking they had won. But when he bowed his head and said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Jesus then went down into Hades. And three days later, Jesus came back up again. With a long arm and a strong hand, God said, Forever, death is defeated. Sin is destroyed. My church is triumphant. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And here we sit, brothers and sisters, redeemed with a strong arm and a mighty hand, and nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's still A new covenant, a new creation. God's into new. You know that, don't you? A new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. He's into a, a new man, a new race of people, Jews and Gentiles who have faith in Christ. He's got us a new name in heaven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And when you get there, Revelation says you don't even know what the name is till you get there. But you've got a new name. Wonder what mine will be, you're asking. Only God knows. I'd like a new name. I never have really liked my name. It's caused me a lot of heartache in my life. They thought I was a girl. They thought I was a wimp. They couldn't pronounce it. I, I never have liked it. But I'm going to get a new name. He picked it out before the foundation of the world. And when I get there and stand in front of him, and he says, well done, good and faithful servant. And by the way, here is your new name. I'm looking forward to that day when I'm not known as Laran anymore. I'll be known as whatever he says I am. New covenant. New creation, new man, new name in heaven, going to a new heaven and a new earth. Hallelujah to God. And then he said in Revelation, behold, I make all things new. God's saying, all this old tired stuff, cursed under the curse of sin, 
I'm going to get rid of it, wash it away. I'm just going to make a new heaven and a new earth so all my new people with new names, all my new creations will have a new place to live throughout eternity. But before we get there, I got one more. Every single morning, his mercies are new. I'm not there yet, so I need some mercy right now. I haven't made it yet. Don't know what my new name is, but I need some mercy right now. But mercy is available every single morning. There's just enough mercy to get me through the day, and I praise him for it right now. You ought to thank God for his mercy this morning. So, Father, thank you. Thank you. Say it, church. Thank you. You taught us on the night that you were betrayed. You took the cup, you took the bread, and you said, this is my body. This makes you remember me. Church, you've heard me say it many times. How simple is this? As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show the Lord's death till he comes. But do this in remembrance of me. <clears throat> and you know why he said that. Because Jesus gets left out. People take communion because they belong to a church. They take communion because they think it's a religious thing. But Jesus said, no, no, it's about me. Everything's about me. So this morning as I consume these two elements, I'm remembering Jesus. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are proclaiming my death till I come and do it to remember me. I remember you now, Jesus. I remember what you saved me from. Don't know the depths of it because sin was far beyond my comprehension. But you saved us. Lord, let everybody in this place know there is not a sin your blood cannot wash away. There is not a transgression that you did not pay for on the cross. The cross. The old rugged cross. So now, Lord, we take this little piece of bread, so simple, and we eat it. As your body, we take you into us. Lord, we take this little cup, this little bit of juice, and by this we proclaim to the whole universe, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world has purchased our redemption. We are not our own. We've been bought with a price. Therefore, we are here to glorify God in our body and in our spirits, the precious blood of God of Jesus. I want us right now to take time and I want you to thank God in every possible way you can imagine for the cross, the blood, and your personal redemption. Take some time. If someone is watching, either from a distance or from right here, and you don't know if you are saved or not, you have questions about your salvation, or are you just one of those blatant sinners and you know it, <clears throat> let me tell you that Jesus Christ the Lamb, the Son, did everything he did for you. 
It's a gift. You don't have to do anything but believe and receive it. God will work out everything else after that. But if you will believe, believe that he's the Christ, believe that God raised him from the dead, he will save you from your sins, all of your sin, every sin. And then the rest of your life, till you die or till he comes, when you do sin again, he says, if you'll just confess it, just tell me about it. I'll wash it away. I'll forgive you. I'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Brother, the blood of Jesus Christ is the mightiest thing in the world. And the whole church said amen. amen. And now, Lord, we depart this place. And we go out rejoicing in our hearts that our sins have been forgiven. Our home is in heaven, and you could come for us any moment. Let us live a life worthy of the calling. And so we pray again. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer, amen. Love you, church. See you Wednesday night for prayer meeting. Bless Jesus.